welcome to this edition of Sojourners Along the Way. I wanted to come up with a bunch of questions to ask you so that way you would do some thinking, but I only came up with one that's kind of uh, good and hopefully it will make you think and it will guide you to the topic for today. The question is, without one of two there would be no you. What is the answer? Without one of two, there would be no you. I went for a rhyme too. Did I succeed? So, sojourners along the way, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about fathers. I'm going to, I'm going to start by reading a scripture, a few different verses. This is from the New International, no, oh dear, it's one of the translations. I think it may be the New American Standard. This is from Ephesians chapter 6, I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. Now, most parents are going to really like the first verse, but please, please, particularly fathers, and yes, we're going to talk about Father's Day. Uh, please focus on verse 4. Verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you, and that you may live long on the earth. Verse 4. Fathers, please pay attention. Grandfathers, too. Uncles, Pay attention to this. Brothers, please pay attention. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Another translation will say, raise your children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Now, these first four verses of the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, are giving instructions to families. Children, it is our responsibility. It makes no difference what the age of our parents are. We are to honor them. We need to learn what that means because in today's society, we're not seeing that. Now, I could go off and just go and, and do a whole entire program talking about these verses and also a few others that are found in Ephesians chapter 6. But I want to focus in on fathers. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Or stepfathers, or a male that is in a very authoritative role with children. You need to be teaching children how to love, how to do good things. Our society today has just stepped away so far from having a good nuclear family, a family that is, is totally filled with love, learning about how much God is love. Now, in English, we have to refer to God with a pronoun, and typically that is in the male gender, father, he, but I, on another program, previous program, I stated that God is a spirit. God is neither male nor female. And I'm saying that up front because there are a lot of issues. And I want to start with that because I want us to get the proper perspective. I want to help people, whether you are a child or an adult, whether you are a father or you have a father, how should we be interacting with those that are in our lives? Very important. And I think as the United States works at getting back to the proper relationship between parents and children, and we start having family time, fathers, raise up your children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a responsibility given to the fathers. Nowadays, 
we are seeing a lot of the responsibility for the children being turned over to the mothers. Maybe that's one reason why Mother's Day is more popular than Father's Day, plus mothers typically, not always, but typically are seen as being, uh, how should I say it, more lenient than fathers are. Fathers seem to have more of the discipline attached to them. Not all families, but it does happen quite a bit. So fathers, please learn what it means. How should the children be raised? How can we teach them to do what is right? Whether you are a believer or you're not a believer, you still have the responsibility to raise your children and to teach them. So I want to start by <clears throat> giving some of the history of Father's Day. Um, it's kind of interesting to see and compare the history of Mother's Day and Father's Day and how, how things came about. So for the history of Father's Day, on July 19th, 19 and 10, the governor of the U.S. state of Washington proclaimed the nation's first Father's Day. However, it was not until 1972, 58 years after President Woodrow Wilson made Mother's Day official, that the day, Father's Day, became a nationwide holiday in the United States. That's pretty interesting to me because especially back then it was rather a male-dominated patriarchal society, male-dominated society. So how is it that Mother's Day came into existence 58 years prior to Father's Day? And there is a similarity, and I'm, I tell you, I'm rooting West Virginia, you go for it. Listen to what West Virginia did regarding Father's Day. Okay, the campaign to celebrate the nation's fathers did not meet the same enthusiasm. Perhaps, as one florist explained, fathers haven't the same sentimental appeal that mothers have. In fact, I have a couple of cute things that I'm going to get to share with you about, you know, when you ask a father, what do you want for Father's Day? What, do you, what kind of answer is typically given? Flowers and chocolate go very well for mothers. Chocolate would go very well for fathers, too. I think they would enjoy it. But on July the 5th, 1908, a West Virginia church sponsored the first event explicitly in honor of fathers. Yay, West Virginia! You were, you were out there getting Mother's Day going, and now here you are doing Father's Day 58 years later. You go for it, West Virginia. So, on July the 5th, 1908, a Sunday sermon in memory of the 362 men who had died in the previous December's explosions at the Fairmont Coal Company mines was one, a one-time commemoration and not an annual holiday. The next year, a Spokane, Washington woman named Sarona Smart Dodd, one of six children raised by a widower, tried to establish an official equivalent to Mother's Day for male parents, fathers. She went to local churches, the YMCA, store, shopkeepers, and government officials to drum up support for her idea, and she was successful. Washington State celebrated the nation's first statewide Father's Day on July 19, 1910. Slowly, the holiday spread. In 1916, President Wilson honored the day by using telegraph signals to unfurl a flag in Spokane when he pressed a button in Washington, D.C. in 1924. President Calvin Coolidge urged state governments to observe Father's Day. However, many man, men continued to disdain the day. As one historian writes, they scoffed at the holiday's sentimental attempts to domesticate manliness with flowers and gift giving, or they decided the proliferation of such holidays as a commercial gimmick to sell more products or other 
often paid for by the father himself. There was, of course, a controversy of and commercialism. During the 1920s and 1930s, a movement, movement arose to scrap Mother's Day and Father's Day altogether in favor of a single holiday, Parents' Day. Every year on Mother's Day, pro-Parents' Day groups rallied in New York City's Central Park, a public reminder said, Parents' Day activist and radio performer Robert Spiel, uh, Spear that both parents should be loved and respected together. Paradoxically, however, the Depression derailed this effort to combine and decommercialize the holidays. Struggling retailers and advertisers redoubled their efforts to make Father's Day a second Christmas for men. Promoting goods such, such as neckties, hats, socks, pipes and tobacco, golf clubs, and other sporting goods and greeting cards. When World War II began, advertisers began to argue that celebrating Father's Day was a way to honor American troops and support the war effort. By the end of the war, Father's Day may not have been a federal holiday, but it was a national institution. In 1972, in the middle of a hard-fought presidential election excuse me, re-election campaign, Richard, Richard Nixon signed a proclamation making Father's Day a federal holiday at last. Today, it is estimated that Americans spend more than one billion dollars each year on Father's Day gifts. Does the, mother, the money come from the fathers or kids? Are you earning the money to give the gifts to your parents, to your father? Father's Day. Five men who exemplify some of history's finest parenting and also a few not-so-fine fathers. Charlemagne. King of the Franks and Emperor of the Romans in the late 8th and early 9th century, Charlemagne had, are you ready for this, he had 20 children some with wives, plural, and others with concubines. He insisted that all receive a thorough education, including the girls. He was a man ahead of his time. Females were not educated in that era. When one of his sons, known as Pepin the Hunchback, was found guilty of participating in a plot to kill Charlemagne, it was expected that Charlemagne would be, that, oh, excuse me, that Charlemagne would have Pepin executed along with his co-conspirators. Instead, the emperor took pity on his son and ordered his sentence be commuted and sent him to a monastery instead. Tsar Nicholas II, the last Russian emperor, Nicholas, had five children with his wife the German board born Alex. A loving father, Nicholas was especially concerned with the health of his only son and heir. Sorry. I'm going to spell it for you because right now the pronunciation went out the door. H E M O P H I L I A. Their child's illness led the Tsar and his wife to consult the controversial healer, Rasputin, whose influence over the royal family compromised their standing on the eve of the Russian Revolution. Mark Twain and his wife, Olivia, had three daughters during their 34-year marriage. Though Mark Twain doted on all his children, Twain was particularly close with his old oldest, Susie, who shared Mark Twain's love of acting and writing. He based at least two major characters in his novels after her. When she died of meningit and meningitis as a young woman in 1896, Twain fell into a deep depression. Later, he included passages written by Susie about her father in his 
autobiography. Syrio, a prominent ancient Roman, states, Roman statesman and philosopher, Syrio adored his daughter and was devastated when she died of complications from childbirth in 45 BC. He was inconsolable despite his friend's many letters of condolence, some of which are still in existence. Cyrano isolated himself for several weeks at the home of his friend, where he read texts by Greek philosophers about how to overcome grief. He divorced his second wife, supposedly because she had not been sufficiently saddened by her stepdaughter's death. Charles Darwin was a devoted dad to ten children, of whom two died in infancy. He played a central role in raising and educating his brood at a time when childbearing was seen, excuse me, child rearing. No, we're not going to go there. Child rearing was seen as women's work. Child bearing is definitely women's work. So, child rearing was seen as women's work. The death in 1851 of 10-year-old Annie was a crushing blow to for Darwin and his wife Emma. Some have speculated that he caused him to lose his religious faith, which I think is really sad, and it does point out God gets blamed for the bad stuff. Usually, God does not get the credit for the good stuff that happens, but something bad happens, it's God's fault. And I would like to take a moment here and say, we bad things happen to good people because sin entered the world. And that was by choice, not something God wanted. God wants good things for everybody. God is love. Peter the Great, the amb ambitious Peter who ruled Russia from 1682 to 1725, fathered 14 children with his two wives, many of whom died young. Not known for his warm parenting style, his, he famously contributed to the death of his firstborn son, who had been convicted of conspiring to kill his father, despite a lack of concrete evidence. Before his planned execution, his son died in his prison cell of wounds sustained during a torture session. Doesn't sound like he was such a great father, does he? But he's called Peter the Great. Contradiction of terms there. Constantine the Great, the Roman Emperor Constantine, who ruled from about 306 AD until his death in 337, fathered six children with his two wives. He had a close working relationship with his eldest son, who oversaw, oversaw many of his father's military campaigns. For reasons that remain unclear, Constantine ordered his son's execution in 326. His son's name was erased from official records and monuments dedicated to him were destroyed. I'm going to end with Herod the Great. King of Judea from 37 to 4 BC, Herod is remembered as an ambitious but cruel and paranoid ruler who infamously ordered the execution of several members of his own family. This included his second wife, his mother-in-law, his brother-in-law, and three of his sons. He is also the one that ordered that all babies at the age of two and under be executed at the time of Jesus' birth because he did not want any competition when the Magi came and told Herod they were looking for the newborn king. Because you see, a king should have been born in a palace. Instead, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus, our Yeshua Messiah, 
was born in a humble manger. Herod tried his best, but he could not defeat God's plan. I have several pieces that I, I want to discuss and tell you, so I, I think I'm going to go to one of the stories about fathers, and this is unfortunately addressing a, a situation that is reoccurring so much more. But I want this story to be an encouragement because nowadays we are seeing a lot of people going through dementia. And I'll put in a plug. Please watch some previous programs and future programs of Sojourners along the way because many of them are addressing health issues it is possible, it is possible to do some things that will help in this area. You can have good health, you can have good mental health. And in many cases, it is not too late, even if dementia has started in. But this is the story about how one daughter deals with her father's dementia. I pray it will be an encouragement to you. Every Wednesday, as I have for the past two years, I leave work and drive to the nearest fast food restaurant. I order a strawberry milkshake and make the 25-mile trip to visit my dad, who has dementia and lives in a nursing home. The routine is familiar. Parking, walking up the winding driveway, entering the tastefully decorated lobby, and signing in with the receptionist. Then it's a right-hand turn down the long hall to the wing where my father lives. Dad won't be in his room when I arrive. Members, as the residents are called, aren't in their private rooms except to sleep. They are encouraged to be involved with one another and to participate in activities throughout the day. As soon as I pass through the arches of the doorway, I spot him. The aides that care for my father are angels. My father looks as he would at home, in casual slacks and a t-shirt or sweater. He is well-groomed. Most days, he also wears one of his beloved ball baseball caps. Usually, it's the red one that proclaims, my grandson is a U.S. Marine. He has no idea which grandson the hat refers to, and if asked, will usually tell a big tale of his time in the Marines. He was never in the military. Within seconds, his head twists around, his hand comes up in a wave, and a smile lights up his face as he spots me. My father doesn't know what he had for lunch. He doesn't know what year or month it is, but he knows who I am, and he's always happy to see me. I reach his side and hand him the milkshake. We exchange the same greeting every week. Dad says, how did you know where to find me? I always respond, Mom told me. As we wheel down the hall toward the main entrance, he eagerly begins to drink his milkshake, telling me that strawberry is his flavor and asking how I knew. On our way out the door, we pass staff members, other visitors and members, all of them and I mean every single one, smiles and greets my father by name. Even now, he is the man everyone knows and loves. Sometimes they will touch my shoulder and say, your father is such a delight. The facility has immaculate lawns with flower gardens and private areas for visitors to sit and spend time with their loved ones. In my father's previous world, as I refer to it, before dementia. He loved roses, so our favorite place is the rose garden. As we make our way there, he will usually ask if I want him to push the wheelchair because it's a lot of work. I smile and assure him that I can use the exercise. We stop and I pull up a chair and settle in. He is drinking his milkshake as I am catching my breath. When my father became a resident at, of the nursing home, I was in the midst of my busy life. My middle son had been deployed to Iraq. I constantly worried about him, and I had two other sons still at home. I have a full-time job, a house, a husband, volunteer activities, and the same list of responsibilities as most busy women. 
There are a lot of Wednesdays when the workday ends and all I want to do is go home. I want to get dinner on the table, get my chores done, and try to squeeze in an hour of relaxing with my husband before going to bed and getting up and starting all over again. But I can't. Because it's Wednesday, and the responsibility I feel to make sure Dad has a visit weighs on me. Once I'm with him, my mood lifts. When we sit in the garden, a sense of peace comes over me. The rest of the world doesn't exist as we talk about the same things over and over, or sit quietly together. <coughs> I'm forced to set aside the rest of my life. I'm forced to be in the moment. In this day and age, when all of us multitask to accomplish as much as possible, as we possibly can in 24 hours, it's a rare treat to be this calm. Sometimes it hits me that five years ago, Dad had the same life most of us do. He was up before the sun and exhausted every night trying to get it all done. But then one morning, he woke up and that life ceased to exist. Dementia had taken its hold. Now we sit in the rose garden and talk about how he built the building behind us. We talk about the weather, the trees, the roses, and whether he slept well last night. Ten minutes from now, we will talk about the same exact things, except it will all be new to him. Soon, if we are quiet enough, the real reason we are here in this garden appears. Our special guests begin to arrive. One by one, their little legs carry them to a cautious spot, not too far from us, but not too close either. Their beady black eyes and big bushy tails might turn some people off, but not us. I pull the bag of peanuts from my purse. Look, Daddy, I point out their, their arrival as if I'm five years old, but now it's my father who is childlike. I take the empty milkshake cup from him and hand him a bag of peanuts. Slowly, he tosses the first one to the closest squirrel, who eagerly snaps it up and stands on his hind legs to peel it. Dad grins and turns his focus to the next squirrel. Over and over, he tosses peanuts to squirrels of all colors and sizes. One is missing half its tail, which prompts a squeakly conversation about how we think he lost it. Sometimes a few ch chipmunks will show up, but mostly it's the squirrels who through some unspoken squirrel underground have found out there are peanuts to be had. Dad smiles at their antics and tells me for the sixth time in an hour that he loves those little guys. I smile and agree that squirrels are wonderful. In his other life, my father was able to coax squirrels to eat from his hand. Dad never made a lot of money. He wasn't famous, and he didn't own a fancy car or house. But he could get a squirrel to eat out of his hand, and to him, that was far more important. Dementia robbed me of my father and robbed him of his life. I know that when I take Dad into dinner tonight, he won't even remember I was there ten minutes after I leave. But in this moment, he knows I'm here, and he knows he loves squirrels. So we feed the squirrels, and Dad loves me every Wednesday. Thank you, Rhonda. Penders for sharing your story with us. A quote for you to meditate on. My father gave me the greatest gift anyone could give another person. My dad believed in me. Thank you, Dad. I love you. There were a number of songs that I wanted to play, and unfortunately, because of copyright laws, wasn't able to do that. But 
I want to encourage you to do a search and listen to these songs because some of them are oldies but goodies. They have a message. Fathers, you play an important role. You need to play an important role in the lives of your children. They need you. And one day you may need them. Sadly, many times, the story that I just read you about Rhonda's father is repeated over and over and over again. We call it the sandwich generation, where there is a, a child, be it the wife or the, or the father, who have children that they care for, and then they also have to care for an ailing parent. Please, let's do what we can. Let's do all that we can for, to honor our parents. So some of the songs are Teach Your Children Well by Crosby, Stills, and Nash, Wind Beneath My Wings by Bette Mittler, Daddy by Beyonce, My Father's Eyes, Amy Grant, <clears throat> excuse me, Daddy's Hands, Conway Twitty, That's My Job, sorry, I don't have the composer for the, these next couple. Grandpa, tell me about the good old days. Daddy, you can let go now. Because You Loved Me by Celine Dion. Butterfly Kisses by Barb Garcia. I hope I pronounced that properly. C-A-R-L-I-S-L-E. I need more help. The Prayer was the song I really wanted to end this program with. Please look that one up. That is by Celine Dion and Josh Groban. And also, um, Because You Loved Me. Um, I think I said that one. Celine Dion, Dion. And also, You Raise Me Up, Josh Groban. There's one, I'm going to read you the words from the song. I wanted to play this. This is a part that is sad, that's attached to um, Father's Day, and maybe this is one reason that there is more done for Mother's Day than Father's Day. Again, I want to repeat that scripture. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Fathers, Patricia's addition. Fathers, love your children. Teach them how to love. This is a song by Mercy Me. It's a contemporary Christian song, and it's called Dear Younger Me. Where do I start? If I could tell you everything that I have learned so far, then you could be one step ahead of all the painful memories still running through my head. I wonder how much different things would be, Dear Younger Me. Dear Younger Me, I cannot decide do I give some speech about how to get the most out of your life, or do I go deep and try to change the choices that you'll make cause they're choices that made me? Even though I love this crazy life, sometimes I wish it was a smoother ride. Dear younger me, dear younger me, if I knew then what I know now, condemnation would have had no power. My joy, my pain, would have never been my worth if I knew then what I know now would have not been hard to figure out what I would have changed if I had heard, Dear younger me, it's not your fault. You were never meant to carry this beyond the cross. Dear younger me, you are holy, you are righteous, you are one of the redeemed, set apart, a brand new heart. You are free indeed, every mountain, every valley. Through each heartache you will see, every moment brings you closer to who you were meant to be. Dear younger me, dear younger me, you are holy, you are righteous, you are one of the redeemed, set apart, a brand new heart. You are free indeed. You are holy. You are righteous. You are one of the redeemed, set apart, a brand new heart. You are free indeed. 
The composer of this song, a member of Mercy Me, shared the details that he came from an extremely abusive background, and he took the blame for that. He thought he must have done something wrong, otherwise why would he be treated this way? And unfortunately it was at the hands of his father. Dear younger me, dear younger me, if I knew then what I know now, condemnation would have no power. My joy, my pain would never been my worth if I knew then what I know now. You were never meant to carry this beyond the cross. Dear younger me, you are holy, you are righteous, you are one of the redeemed, set apart, a brand new heart. You are free indeed. If you did experience abuse at the hands of your father or mother, now would be a good time to work on those issues. Because you see, it may have happened a long time ago, it may have happened a while ago, it may be a short time, it might be going on now, but it's not your fault. It was never meant to be. You are created in the image of God. The perfect parent is how I like to call God. Think of God, love. God doesn't want this type of thing to happen in anybody's life. It ought not to be. We need to work at that, to change it, to teach where needed, to teach parents how to be good parents. We want good things to happen. I'm going to read you a very short Chinese proverb. Tension is who you think you should be. Relaxation is who you are. Dear younger me, dear younger me, holy, redeemed, loved, loved. I'm going to read you another story. <clears throat> and this is titled, My Soul is Crushed with Longing. That comes from Psalms 119, verse 20. Growing up in El Albertan, Georgia, my childhood was happy, except for one particular holiday. I dreaded it, pretended it didn't exist, tried to ignore it, but no matter what I did, a secret longing remained in my heart. You can't celebrate Father's Day. Your father's dead. You don't even have a real memory of him. As an adult, I still couldn't come to terms with that longing. I still wanted to celebrate Father's Day with my own daddy. Then, a few years ago, the Atlantic Journal-Constitution invited readers to submit memories of their father's shoes and what the shoes had meant to them as children. My memory was as real as if it happened yesterday. I was about eight years old and accidentally discovered a pair of my father's shoes hidden way back in my mother's closet. My paper dolls suddenly forgotten. I touched the dusty shoes tenderly, examined them thoroughly in the sunlight, laced and unlaced them, and finally cradled one in each arm. I mailed my memory to the newspaper because it satisfied something in me that I didn't fully understand. Lo and behold, the newspaper sent a photographer to my house. He took pictures of me holding an eight by eight photograph of the father I'd never known. That Father's Day, I crept out before sunrise and found our newspaper in the driveway. There, in living color, was a picture of me with my father and for the first time, I genuinely celebrated Father's Day. Dear perfect parent, Father God, your unexpected ways of healing are as remarkable as your indescribable love. 
I don't know whether your father is still living, whether you are a father, your grandfather is still living, or you are a grandfather, whatever the relationship. Let love be at the center of it. Bring healing where there's a need for healing. If there's a need to forgive, let forgiveness flow. On a lighter side, typically many times when fathers are asked, what do you want for Father's Day? What answer is said? Probably the majority of the time. The answer is nothing. Now, I heard this on the radio and I thought it was really cute, so I decided to explore it. And of course, the greatest way to get answers is to Google them, right? So I heard it on the radio that you would be able to pay for a lease for the day, a one-day lease for Father's Day. And it's only good on Father's Day. And you can lease a part of a town by the name of Nothing. Nothing is an uninhabited ghost town in eastern Mojave County, Arizona. Mojave? How do you say that? Sorry. Arizona, please accept my apologies. The history. The locals told travelers it got named by a bunch of drunks. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what it says in this article about nothing that I found through Google. Nothing has frequently been noted on list of unusual place names. The settlement was established in 1977. Father's Day started in 1977. A few years later, we had a, tame name, a town named Nothing, so that way fathers could have what they asked for when they wanted to have nothing for Father's Day. This settlement was established again in 1977. It's located 100 miles northwest of Phoenix, Arizona, and roughly 20 miles south of the Rattle State capital of Arizona. It is west of Baghdad, which I think is pretty interesting because I always thought Baghdad was over in the eastern part of the world. At milepost 148 and a half on U.S. Route 93, the Joshua Forest Scenic Parkway, between Wickenburg and Kingman on the route from Las Vegas to Phoenix, Arizona. The Arizona Department of Transportation installed one of four motorist call boxes on U.S. 93 at nothing. The town sign reads, Town of Nothing, Arizona. Found it 1977, elevation 3,269 feet. The staunch citizens of Nothing are full of hope, faith, and believe in the work ethic. Through the years, these dedicated people had faith in Nothing, hoped for Nothing, worked at Nothing for Nothing. Commerce and Attractions Nothing once contained a gas station and small convenience store. Recent history, nothing was abandoned by May 2005. And by August 2008, the gas station was beginning to collapse. An attempted revival of nothing occurred at some time after August 2008 when nothing was purchased by Mike Jensen. By April 2009, Jensen had opened his pizza business, run from a portable oven, with hopes of reopening the mini mart and creating accommodations for RVs. As of April 2011, it appeared that nothing was once again abandoned. The building was freshly bored and had fresh boards in the windows and no sign of inhabitation or any activity. Maybe nothing needs something.
So, if you are looking for a unique gift to give to your father on Father's Day, or a father that is in your life, you can see about you getting something about nothing for your father. What makes a dad? God took the strength of a mountain, the majesty of a tree, the warmth of a summer sun, the calm of a quiet sea, the generous soul of nature, the comforting arm of night, the wisdom of the ages, the power of the angel eagle's flight, the joy of a morning in spring, in spring the faith of a mustard seed, the patience of eternity, the depths of a family need, then God combined these qualities when there was nothing more to add. God knew God's masterpiece was complete. And so God called it Dad. Author unknown. That's for all you dads out there. Let you know you are loved and appreciated. For those whose father has died, this is R.I.P. I thought of you with love today, but that is nothing new. I thought about you yesterday and days before that too. I think of you in silence. I often speak your name. All I have are memories and your picture in a frame. Your memory is my keepsake with which I'll never part. God has you in God's keeping. I have you in my heart. And that is the, my case because my father has passed on. I like the title of this next poem. It's written for those who have a stepfather or um, as this title is, a second dad. Even though you're not my dad, I know that you'll be there. With the little things you do, you let me know you care. You're always there to help, whatever the need may be. You've given of yourself, and so unselfishly. Now you're becoming the dad that I have never known. I'm drawn to you more every day for the kindness you have shown. I just want to thank you and let you know I care. A second dad, as great as you, is something very rare. And take a moment and reflect on the positive things, the happy times, the good memories. And this one is, is special to me because it is something I did with Dad, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. It's written from the voice of a young child. My daddy will teach me. Daddy, it's my greatest wish that my little hands will catch a big fish. When I'll be there fishing with you, I know you'll teach me what to do. You'll show me how to bait my hook when we fish the lakes and brook, and how to find the fishing hole, the way to cast my fishing pole. Daddy, I know that you're dreaming, too, of the special times I will spend with you. My father and I went fishing, but we went off the jetty, and if you don't know what a jetty is, it's that pile of rocks that sticks out into the ocean. And we also went off the charter boats, and sometimes with a friend that had a boat. And then finally my father took up a, another hobby, and I was the one of three children with two older brothers. I was the one that got the most involved in all of my father's hobbies. So we combined two, sailing and also fishing. And it was really a lot of fun because when we would go fishing out on the ocean, we'd get some sea bass or trout or whatever was um, in season at the time. And we'd call home and say, start the charcoal fire because we're having fish for dinner tonight. And that was always a lot of fun. Fresh, fresh fish. You have no idea the difference of the fish that you buy in the stores, especially if it's frozen, and having fresh fish right out of the ocean. Please think about your happy moments with your father. And another one for you. Number one, dad. One sure thing about fathers. A father is often a kind and good man who helps you to thrive as well as he can. A helpful father always does his best. He never seems to rest. Fathers try to help you to do better. He probably taught you your alphabet letters. But fathers are human. They make mistakes too. 
Sometimes they might get angry at you. Sometimes you might also get mad at Dad for forgetting your birthday or making it bad. But even when he's too much to endure, your father loves you. That much is sure. My father passed on actually while I was working in Beijing, China. We had talked because we knew, we knew his time was coming and it's like I was so distraught. What do I do? I knew I was supposed to go to work in China, but I wanted to be there for my father. I had for two years of my life, two of almost the end of my father's life, been to be with my father, to help him during that time. I'm very thankful for that because had I not gone there, I would not know that my father, when he did die, would spend eternity in heaven. But as a result of those two years of being there with my father, I now know I will see my father again, and that gives me great peace. I do want to pray for the fathers that are watching this program. I want to pray that you will be blessed. You will be blessed. You will be honored. Children, honor your father. Even though my father is gone, there are things that I have done since his death in honor of my father. There are things that I've learned about my father that have helped me to appreciate him much more. Fathers, please reach out to your children and help them to understand. Express your love for them. At, at one point in my life, I had to tell my father, I said, Dad, I need to hear these words from you. I need to hear you say that you love me. Now, on some level, of course, I knew my father loved me, but he didn't express it. And I don't know, maybe it's because I'm a female, but I think guys need to hear it too. Dads, please tell your children you love them. Tell them you care, that you want to share your life with them, that you want to be with them. Let's make Father's Day a day of honoring, a, a, a day of celebration. If your father has passed on as mine has, you can still find ways to honor him. You can do things in his memory. You can make a donation. There are many, many, many people in need. And in this country right here, there are shelters around this country that need the support to be able to help the kids. There's children's services that could use help. Please, let's make our country a better place than what it has become. Let's turn it around for the good. Fathers, please rise up. Rise up and take the lead. You have the responsibility. Fathers, do not provoke your children. Raise them in the fear and the admonition of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't know Jesus as your Savior and Lord, this might be a good time to do that. I want to close this program with a song, so I'm going to sing it. And it's one that I hope you are familiar with. I'll sing it twice. Once with sign language, once without. And if you know it, please sing it with me. If you know the words, please say them with me. And you're going to have to forgive me, but I'm going to close my eyes while I sing it. <clears throat> Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us 
from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Sing it with me or just watch as I sing it again in English and in sign language. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is. In heaven, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. <clears throat> For thine is the kingdom and the power and the knowing that God is the perfect parent. God does not want bad things to happen. God loves you, wants to hold you, to cradle you, and to love you, to love on you. May you receive God's love this time. Happy Father's Day, fathers, and God bless you abundantly. Mm -hmm.